Coastal Sasquatch. He has also been on the Extreme Expeditions Northwest documentaries for Port Chatham, which is quite infamous up here for its uh, historical lore with Bigfoot. So without further ado, I will bring up Larry. Hello? Testing, testing. How's everybody doing? I want to thank you guys for coming to the second portal of Bigfoot Expo ever here in Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, I know it looks kind of easy with you get here and everything set up and all the chairs are here, but um, it's a lot of work. And Jesse, Heidi, Norm, and Michael put a ton of effort into getting all this put together, organizing it. So please give them a round of applause. Before we start. <laughs> I'm going to try not to stand in front of my slides, but uh, I'm going to pace like a cake down here probably, so if I need to move, just tell me. Um, tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Larry Beans Baxter. Beans is my nickname. Don't worry, I'm going to tell you how I got it. Um, I am a retired police officer, served 15 years, uh, and then four in the military for about 20 years total service, and recently retired. I was the investigation sergeant down at Homer PD, uh, which meant that I was either in charge of or supervised any major investigations, felony crimes, anything like that. So if you came to my town and got murdered, I'd be the one trying to figure out who did it. So lucky that never happened to me. No, I'm joking. I was actually really good with him. <laughs> um, i tell you guys what, though. You know, it's good to see some pro law enforcement people here. I saw some people perk up. I was speaking at a conference one time, and I mentioned that, that I worked in law enforcement, and this lady in the front row right here, she goes, get off the stage, pig. <laughs> that was the last time I invited my mom to come see me. <laughs> All right, here's another question for you. Before we get started, I want to test your Bigfoot knowledge, okay? Why do Bigfoot eat snails? Anybody got a guess? Because they don't like fast food. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Fort Chatham, and then toward the end, I'm going to talk about uh, this place called Area A that you guys know from the Small Town Monster documentary and some of my videos. Um, some of this is from my last presentation. Some of the photos are a little bit the same. I'm going to talk about the history. Uh, at this point, I kind of feel like I have to talk about Fort Chatham a little bit. If I don't, you can kind of expect it. It's like, uh, you guys know the comedian Burt Kreischer and his story about the machine. If he doesn't tell people, what about the machine? Tell us the machine. So people are like, yeah, talk about Port Chatham. So we're going to do some Port Chatham. We're going to do some Area A stuff. And I got my pointer here. Let's make sure it works. Everybody see that? Yeah. See the red dot? OK. No cats in there, are there? I don't want to get attacked. Uh, so we're going to start off. I'm going to show you guys where Port Chatham is. So this is the Kenai Peninsula. And is there anybody in here that's not from Alaska, doesn't live in Alaska? OK, I'm going to show you guys some super secret squirrel Alaska stuff, OK? You can't be telling these other people about this, OK? All right, so when you want to tell somebody where something in Alaska is, you've got an Alaska map with you right now. You just don't know what I'm about. So what you do when you want to tell somebody or something in Alaska is, you can go about your map. There it is. So this is the Aleutian chain. There's southeast. And then we're in here somewhere in Fairbanks. And the Kenai Peninsula is down here. It's all simple. Well, we can take a picture of it. I can see her. I was photographing you. I know. I'm just, I'm just joking. I know. So down the Kenai Peninsula on the southern tip is Port Chatham. It's down here. Don't pay attention to that. That's where I am. But it's down here, the very tippy bottom. And interestingly enough, area A, the place I'm going to talk about a little bit later, is over here. Just to point this out, from here to here is nothing really. There might be a few cabins in there, uh, but there's not really any towns, infrastructure, anything to speak of. It's pretty desolate, and there's a lot of room stuff moving around. You've got the Harding High Hills in here. Um, you've got all these little bays and stuff that 
are all more than capable of supporting large populations of animals. There's tons of bear and moose and everything else in there. We're zooming in. So this is actually Port Chatham. Uh, this is the bay. So there's some confusion. A lot of people say there were two towns. There was Port Chatham and there was Port Lock. Port Chatham is the bay and Port Lock was the town. There wasn't two towns. Uh, I've confirmed that with a resident that was born and raised there. He said it was just the one town of Port Lock. If you look right there, that's where that little cabin was. It was in the opening slide. You can almost see it right there in that clearing. It's the only structure that you can see on the map. Um, there's a couple other cab cabins, structures in the wood line here, and then where the processing plant was, where the machinery is, that's going to be right in here. It's all pretty close together. Cabin, processing, and then a couple other cabins here. This is an interesting little lagoon here. Uh, if you're familiar with the legend of Port Chatham, they say that there was a lagoon where some bodies were washed up. I didn't find anything in my research to verify that, but it is a lagoon that's pretty close to where the town would have been. So I'm not going to give you death. I'm not going to read this verbatim. Don't worry. If you want to read it, feel free. I'm going to give you the cook notes. Uh, in the 1700s, the area first became, uh, got on the white man's radar, uh, Captain Portlock sailed through there, and he was really impressed with the natural resources. He made uh, notes about it in his ship log. He says, man, this place, uh, it's, it's got a lot going on. We should probably take advantage of it. Uh, late 1700s, George Vancouver came through with a fleet of ships. Uh, he mapped the area, and he named that day, after one of his ships, HMS Chatham. By the way, the locals say Chatham. You say Chatham, though. They'll, they'll make fun. So when I first started out, I was saying Chatham. I think I went on a couple podcasts and was like, yeah, poor Chatham, poor Chatham. And that's a very not very much not good reception to that. It's Chatham, like Chatham, Chatham. <clears throat> so we first started seeing signs of industry in the early 1900s. Uh, they opened up sawmills, they opened up the fish processing plant. Uh, contrary to popular belief, belief, which we're going to touch on a little bit here in a minute, the sawmill was actually the driving economic force in the town, not the fishing. Uh, you kind of see the, the workers in the cannery here, they're, they're taking them from the local native villages, uh, they're paying them like 15, 25 cents, not, almost nothing. And um, they had kids working in there. There was a gentleman who uh, approached me, <clears throat> wanted me to talk to his grandmother. I didn't get the chance. Uh, she sadly passed away before. She wasn't in very good health. We kept trying to arrange something where I could talk to her on the phone. Uh, this was during the pandemic. They weren't really letting people come into the villages all willy nilly. And uh, tried to talk to her on the phone a couple times. She was in bad health. She was always taking a nap or something when we tried to set it up. And uh, he told me, she was born in Port Chatham, and she was working in the cannery when she was like eight years old, making like 15 cents an hour. So apparently OSHA wasn't a thing right then. All right, so we got the Cromont mine. That was active in the early 1900s. Um, big demand for that around World War I. Then after the war, the demand kind of dropped off. Uh, they started building, making aluminum with this stuff, and the mine closed. At least 25 people worked there. Uh, I'm not sure exactly on the map where the mine is. Uh, we never found it. We weren't really looking for it either, though. Uh, but from what I understand, it's if you go looking for it, if you look for it hard enough, you can find it, and you can still actually go inside the mine, although I would not recommend it. Uh, there's some trails. There were trails that uh, connected Fort Block to Port Graham and that wallet. Uh, from what I understand, those trails no longer exist. They're all grown up. And from what I understand, people like around on the holidays and stuff, they would have dances, they would have big community events. And it wasn't a big deal for somebody to walk from one town to the other to attend some kind of gathering or potluck or something like that. 
Uh, sawmill, like I said before, was a driving economic force, and they made the wood, they made the fish traps, and uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit more here in a little bit. And so you got all this industry, you got all this stuff going on in the 1900s, and then 50 years later, by 1950, there is nobody there. Uh, the postmaster left, and the town was abandoned, and it was pretty much left to rot. Um, in 2009, there was an article published in the Homer Tribune, which I'll give you guys a little inside baseball. This really does say it here. The way they wrote that article, I'm going to one time. So, yeah, Alaska is the biggest state, but it's a small state. Everybody knows everybody. Um, so this article appears in 2009, and that kind of started like the modern interest in the area. Uh, you saw people start to, to write about it online. Uh, she talked about the, the legend of the Nantanok, uh, how people mysteriously died there, how the town was abandoned. Uh, she also mentioned uh, some ghost activities, some ghost stories about a woman in black. Uh, personally, I haven't found any collaborating source for that, uh, that that talks about the legend of the dark lady, uh, I believe. There was an article that came a couple years ago that said maybe everything she said wasn't entirely true. Uh, I can't speak to the veracity of that article because I actually spoke to the gentleman that wrote it and he misquoted me hard, like really, really bad. So I doubt the veracity of that article. But um, I do know that some of the stuff she spoke about was true. <clears throat> so we got some misconceptions. I touched on the two towns, how there was just the one town. Uh, this was one of my favorite. The building on a highway contributed to the demise of the town. You see this, this is getting thrown about a, a lot in the skeptic circles where people say, well, it wasn't it wasn't Bigfoot that killed the town, it was uh, the highway. Because around 1950, I guess they finished the Sterling Highway to connect Homer to Anchorage. Um, I, don't, I don't believe that because my argument is, well, if the town killed Portlock, why didn't it kill Man Wallet? Why didn't it kill Fort Grant? Why is Sylvopia still there? Why are there still towns across the bay? If, why did the highway just kill that one town? Why didn't it kill more? Uh, I've asked that question to the people that are perpetuating that theory, and nobody's answered. So we'll wait for that. Uh, there's another story out there called The Strangest Story Ever Told, told by Robert Culp. It takes place in uh, southeast Alaska. It's a story of some prospectors. They got chased by what they call devils. Uh, it's been attributed to Bigfoot. I don't know if that's what it was or not. But somehow, I, I guess just because it's a alleged Bigfoot story that takes place in Alaska, and you got Bigfoot stories in Fort Town, somehow that story's kind of got a little, it got melted. And uh, people will say that that took place in Fort Town. Uh, it did not. So, the name is called their big hairy creature, Nantanok. Uh, there's a lot of different names for it. Uh, every tribe has their own name. Uh, there's a lot of different translations for it. Uh, you ask one, and they'll say, well, it means Bigfoot. You'll ask somebody else, and they'll say, well, it just means giant hairy thing. Uh, you ask somebody else, and they'll say, well, it's, it just means monster. Uh, some will say, well, it just doesn't translate well. It just means Nantanok. That's what it is. It is a Nantanok. I like that explanation, but it doesn't really have a direct translation. Uh, there's a poem that was published years ago talking about a caveman that lives in Antinoch. I think it's in my, in my book, Abandoned. Uh, I find that it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting piece of uh, literature because it was written years ago before this Bigfoot craze, if you will, started about Fort Chatham. Uh, and it talks about a caveman that lives in near Fort Chatham. Uh, you've got allegations that the Nantanok is a kidnapper. Uh, they say, don't, uh, don't send your kids outside when it's foggy, because the Nantanok will kill them. Uh, one of the local radio stations, they do um, a word of the week in the local uh, native language. And one Halloween, they did Nantanok, and that was the that was the sentence. You know, they tell you how to Nantanok, and they tell you how to like, pronounce it. And the name is a sentence. And the sentence was, don't let your kids go outside when he's foggy, or the Nantanok will get them. You know, that was their Halloween edition of the word of the week. 
Uh, there's another local tribe across the bay. They have a name for their monster called Antinella. Um, the Denina people, I believe, uh, I get correct, I don't like pronouncing that all the time. I have not probably pronounced it wrong, so don't, don't quote me. Uh, they call theirs the Nantana, which means the ones that steal us, which is creepy as heck. So in the early 1900s, you've got the first like sign that maybe things aren't really going well in Fort Chatham. Uh, there's tells that the workers were kind of refusing to go to work. They were saying, hey, there's something here. It's, you know, it's messing with us. We don't want to work. And from what I can, my, what my research shows, the cannery actually hired like painters in type security. It wasn't painters in, but basically hired a security force to come and keep watch on the town to kind of placate the workers and make them feel safe to come back to work. Uh, you've got the telephone check. He was a native hunter. He was out paddling around with his buddies in his Bedarka one day going hunting. And he tells them, hey, uh, you guys need to drop me off here on the shore. I'm going to go live in the woods and be a Nantanon. And they kind of, you know, oh, stop, stop being silly. You know, they'll do that. And he gets a little aggressive with them, so they don't know what to do with him. So finally, they just find and kill him and kick him off. A few months later, some of his hunting buddies are in town, on the outskirts of town. They run into Munchuck. Munchuck, he's starting to turn into a Nantanon. He's hairy. He's having a hard time speaking English. Um, he's, he's kind of talking in whistles and grunts. But he conveys to them somehow, I guess he can still speak a little bit of English, uh, hey, don't let my wife come outside because I'm afraid that uh, that I might kidnap her and I need to stay home and raise the kids, so lock her up. And uh, that's a pretty common trope you see in a lot of legends, uh, all kinds of mythologies. You see the monster wanting to come into the town and take the women and children, you know, take the things that are important to the, to the men. Uh, and it's a common, Commentary. You see a lot. Also gives the Nantanak a little bit more of a supernatural element. Uh, I like to compare that story to the legend of the Kushaka. Uh, Kushaka is another one that if you came in contact with it, there's a chance that you could turn into a Kushaka. Uh, you've got the death of Andrew Canblock. He was a gentleman that was working the logging operation. Uh, he was related to uh, Wayne Kell from the previous slide, the one uh, from the news article. And he was found killed with a piece of logging equipment. They said a big piece of equipment. They never named it. Uh, in my book, I did a dramatization of this and called it a log skitter, but I, I honestly don't know what it was. And they said that he was hit in the head with it and that this piece of equipment was too heavy for a man to win. Um, I spent a lot of time looking into that. I really wanted to confirm if that's how he died contacted the state records department. This is a funny story. Uh, and there was a nice lady there who was going to help me look. And I said, look, I'm trying to find this gentleman's death certificate. Uh, he was died in Fort Lock. That's about all I know about him and his name. And I found some records of his where the names kind of spelled a little different. Uh, sometimes it's spelled like a C. Same time. Sometimes it's spelled Camp Lock. So she said she would help me. She said, yeah, maybe we'll find it. So finally, she looks for a couple weeks, uh, gets back to me, she's like, I can't find his desk. And granted, it wouldn't prove that Nantanok or Bigfoot killed Mr. Camlock, but it would give some political veracity to the story. Like, okay, you're saying he got hit in the head with a piece of logging equipment, and if on his death certificate, it said he died from head trauma, hey, you know? I'm sure they're not gonna put Bigfoot killed him on the death certificate, but you know, we can't get everything we want. So she, she contacted me, she goes, I can't find it anywhere, I don't know where it could be. She says, maybe you could look at the Homer PD and maybe see if they have it. <laughs> she, she had no idea that I worked there. She was just, I was like, lady, I'm sure they don't have it, I assure you. So anyway, the search for Mr. Kenlock's death certificate was a, a dead end, no pun intended. Uh, you've got to tell Tom Larson, a resident of Fort Chow, or Fort Lock, I use the names interchangeably. Uh, Mr. Larson has a very common tale that you hear all the time. Uh, he was out, I believe he was checking fish traps or something, and he saw the Nantanok, and he actually had a, a 
rifle with him, and he says, this is it. I'm going to prove this thing is real. He gets it in his sights, and he doesn't pull the trigger because he says it looks too human, which is something you hear a lot. It's common among a lot of hunter sightings. Uh, they actually look at it through their scope or down the barrel and just decide not to do it because they think maybe it's too human. Uh, we have Sergius Moon sighting. This is an interesting sighting to me. I think it's fascinating because Sergius, he says he saw an astronaut walking down the beach carrying a club. And I think that's, you know, some interesting phrasing that he said club. Uh, I wish he was still alive so I could interview him. I'd, I'd like to ask him, like, why did you say club and not like stick or a branch? It wasn't, was there something about the, the thing he was carrying that made you say club instead of something else? You know, was it was a rack and bar bar. Did it have an astronaut's initials on it? Like what, what, what differentiates, differentiates a stick and a branch from a club? Is there some indication of tool manipulation or use there? But, uh, Sadly, Sergis has passed on, so we'll probably never know. In 2018, Stephen Major, he's uh, one of the sponsors of uh, this event from Extreme Expeditions. He contacts me, he says, hey, uh, we're going to Fort Chatham, you want to go? Uh, I thought about it for about two seconds, and I was like, hell yeah, I do. So he set us up, made the arrangements, got us out there, and me and him and a film crew went out uh, in 2018. We found the search of the Fort Chatham Harry Man. Um, Stephen is, he, he's uh, got some great resources. He's a good guy, but he's kind of a ready, fire, aim guy. You know, he's like, we're just going to do it. Let's go do it. And then you get there and you're like, man, you know, it would be nice if, if we had this, or if we did this, or we did that. So, you know, hindsight's always 20 fun. So we probably should have went out there and spent a whole lot more time. Uh, I would have liked to have camped on the on the ground there. Uh, we actually stayed on the boat at night. Uh, we just didn't have enough people to do like a 24-hour watch on the camp. And basically, I was acting as team security. I was the only person that really had any weapons training or anything like that. And uh, we just didn't feel safe, uh, you know, with the camera people. I didn't want to sleep and know that my safety and well-being was in the hands of the cameraman's brother, Toad. I know, there's two guys on the expedition, one of them beans, one of them Toad, what are the, what are the odds? Uh, I didn't want him in charge of keeping me safe, you know, because he's a 20 year old kid, and I'm sure he would probably fall asleep just like I did many times on Firewatch when I was in the Army. All right, so we pull up, we get off on the beach here, you see some machinery there on the shore, um, what's interesting about this is we just, we just see it sitting there and we're like, oh, that's kind of interesting. But what's happening, and we're going to talk about it here in a little bit, but the cannery, where it was, is up here on this bluff, and uh, this is where this is coming from. This is getting eroded away. And stuff is starting to fall down onto the beach. Here's one of the other structures. This one you can't see from the map or the air. Uh, you can see the roof's kind of sagging and starting to kind of succumb to the elements there. Uh, when we went in 2018, uh, this seemed a little bit, probably one of the more structurally sound um, structures there, cabins. Then we went back in 2019, there had been a pretty significant earthquake, and we could actually tell, like, you know, we were like, last time we were here was, was this wall leaning this far? <laughs> so it's probably just a matter of time before these structures are gone. Uh, I kind of feel like, um, I was kind of privileged to go out there and see them. Uh, they're not going to be there forever. I, I wonder sometimes maybe if the English Bay Corporation, the corporation owns the land, if they're not going to do something one day and maybe uh, try and preserve it or I don't know, do something because it's not going to be there much longer. And uh, it's kind of sad when you think about it because there's a lot of history there. Uh, this is an interesting find. So we're walking, we're up on that bluff where I was showing you earlier, not too far from where the cannery is. And this is our first like kind of sign of civilization. There's like a whale or something here. And some boards over it, some wood. There's nails in the wood there. And we come upon this little thing of trash. There's like the back of a TV or something, some stereo parts, 
no, no, it's just garbage. And it was kind of funny because we're walking through the woods. I mean, just thick, thick, heavy brush, hard to get around. Uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have been out in the bush here before in Alaska. And we come kind of in this clearing, and there's this pile of garbage here. And we're kind of like, huh, isn't that something? You can't get away from litter, you know, it's everywhere, even in Fort Chatham. Didn't really think that much about it, kind of annoyed by it. Uh, you know, looked at it, took a picture, and walked on. And it's one of those moments where it's kind of like, you know, hindsight's 2020, and I was sitting around one day thinking, like, how the hell did that stuff get there? Because we're up, up on the bluff, probably a couple of stories, uh, nowhere near the beach. That stuff's probably too heavy for the wind to pick up and put there, and it's all kind of in this little pile. If somebody was just going to come from one of the local villages and dump their trash, why would they lug it up on that on that block where we're at? Why wouldn't they just throw it off on the beach or throw it in the water, even better? And uh, now I wish, it, I, I, in hindsight, I was like, man, I wish I would check that out a little bit closer, uh, maybe inspect some of that stuff to see what it was, uh, see if there was any like, claw marks or chew marks. And just taking a closer look at it. It's kind of odd, that little collection of trash there. It just makes me wonder that maybe it was stuff that washed up on the beach and something took it up there. I don't know. I, it's just, I think about it a lot more than I probably should, but uh, it, it bothers me. It's one of those things where you see something that you really, should, it really shouldn't be there and you don't realize it shouldn't have been there until after the fact. But uh, it's just a, it's, I know it's a, ooh, a serious trash pile, you know? But, when you think about it, where it is and how it got to be there, it actually is pretty mysterious. That gives you an idea how high up we were. Uh, you can see the jellyfish down there on the beach. But how, how did that stuff get up there? How did that trash get up there? It's weird. There's Stephen and Reed checking out the scenery. So we get into where the cannery is. Here is some of the machinery. Uh, you'll see that it's all just out there in the elements, kind of rusted. Again, I'd really like to see something be done, but I don't know why. But uh, it was too heavy for them to leave, or to take, so they just left it. And uh, it's still there, it's just sitting there rotten. It's uh, pretty interesting when you look at this stuff and try to figure out what it is. I'm not an engineer, you know, I can barely change the oil in my car. Uh, but everything, all the bigger pieces of machinery seem to have these big wheels on them. And I assume it's probably to turn some kind of belt or something. There's some kind of, I imagine that was probably some kind of boiler or something. I don't know. So this is an interesting photo. It's hard to tell from the photo, but right here, where the white washes out this photo, that's the that's the block. That's the cliff. There's probably about three feet here of land left before this thing starts to fall over. Um, I think it's kind of sad. I mean, I don't know what we can do about it. It's not, you know, the English Bay Corporation owns it. Uh, maybe somebody should start some kind of petition to preserve some of this stuff. But uh, again, you've got the big wheels probably that held some kind of, turn some kind of belt. Uh, There's probably a dock or something that went out that way. And I don't know, maybe a conveyor belt or something to bring fish up. To the, uh, to the top of the bluff there where the factory was. Uh, so it's pretty cool too because some of this stuff, it'll have like manufacturing information on it. It'll be stamped. Uh, there was one piece they found that said like it was made in Chicago. It's interesting, especially if you're a history buff. This thing, uh, I assume it's probably some kind of furnace or something. You can see some information stamped in it right there. Uh, this is a funny story because we find this thing and we're kind of looking at it and I tell Stephen, I'm like, you know, we need to be really thorough. You know, there could be evidence anywhere. I said, somebody should probably crawl in there and check it out. I was joking. I wasn't being serious. But, you know, Stephen, he's hardcore, he's dedicated. He sticks his head in there. And the whole time all this is going on, all I can think about is what in the world are we going to do when he pulls his head out of there and it's full of porcupine quills or he's got an alien face hugger stuck on him. This is an interesting piece. Uh, we were kind of away from the town site, just kind of exploring a little bit. Saw a little piece of white sticking up out of the ground. Kind of kicked it a little bit with my boot. Realized there was more to it, pulled it out. It's like a woven bottle, container of some type. Uh, 
pretty cool. I pulled it out, took a look at it, took a photo. Um, one of the guys was like, oh, man, you should take that with you. And I'm like, I'm not taking anything out of here. Uh, I'm not, uh, one, I didn't have permission. Two, I like Michael Scott in the office. I'm not superstitious, but I'm a little stitious. Uh, this is an interesting impression we found up near the canopy area. Uh, could be a bear. I don't know. Uh, this is Toad. Remember I was telling you Toad? This is Toad's foot. He wears a 10 and a half extra tough. Uh, and we've had him plop that down there for scale. So we had some interesting stuff uh, that we kind of observed there. So we get there, we're walking around the woods, and we find, eventually, we start finding a bear boot. Uh, and then we find this big area that's full of blueberry bushes. I mean, just blueberry bushes as far as I can see, uh, bear poop everywhere, you know, what you would expect to see. And uh, all the blueberry bushes have been pit clean, you know, maybe a blueberry here or there. And uh, we continued on, we pressed a little bit further, we kept going. And we come to this area, again, blueberry bushes everywhere, and the blueberry bushes were just back. I mean, there was blueberries falling off along the ground, and it kind of seemed to me, anyway, it seemed like we had passed a barrier uh, to basically where the bears were like, we're not touching those berries. Those berries belong to somebody else, but we can have all these berries that we want. It's just an observation. Um, maybe there was something to it, maybe not. Uh, there's a story in Robert Alley's book, Rainbow Sasquatch, which is excellent, and I recommend every one of you read it, uh, where a gentleman's on a boat looking at the shoreline. He sees, uh, bear, walk out, walk along the beach, stop, smell, turn around, walk the other way, and then from stage left or the opposite direction, he sees the Sasquatch walk out of the woods onto the beach, Sasquatch stops, smells, presumably smells the bear, turns around, walks away, I don't know, it just seems interesting, and I think probably if they did occupy an area near each other, they could probably do their best to avoid each other. I don't think either one really wants to extend the energy to try and hurt the other one. And uh, I don't see them, unless maybe it's an injured bear or something like that, a Sasquatch trying to take down a bear. Uh, this gives you an idea of the terrain that we were walking through. Uh, kind of gives you an explanation for, like, why do you guys like just hang out there all the time? Well, because I'm old and fat, and that's hard to walk through. And uh, it's also hard to walk through that film at the same time. You know, uh, this is pretty much the standard for what it is out there. It's just nice, soft, squishy tundra. It's not good for tracks. Uh, you step in it, it bounces back. Uh, just stuff like that everywhere. It's like Jurassic Park or something. It's really unforgiving. A couple of clearings here and there, but for the most part, that's what you're looking at. Uh, we were walking through an area kind of like this. Then there was a clearing, more trees. And I was walking with uh, Mary Beth, the female, was in the photo earlier. She says, uh, man, I kind of got a weird feeling. You feel like we're being watched? I was like, eh, maybe, I don't know. I mean, we're a poor child. I suppose we, we could be watched. Pull out my thermal camera, start scanning that tree line. And um, I, I see, you got to talk here about the curse of Bigfoot, right? We've been into this subject for a little bit here on the curse of Bigfoot. Basically, it's when somebody sees something, like a Bigfoot walks out in front of them and they've got their camera, and they're like, look, a Bigfoot, and they don't take a picture and the Bigfoot walks off. Uh, it's kind of, it happens so much, it's a, it's, a, it's a thing. So, I'm looking through my thermal, and I see in that tree line, I see, uh, you guys familiar with the video game Donkey Kong? I see Donkey, the silhouette, it's a thermal camera, so black is hot, for reference here in a second. Um, so everything black is put in off key. I see this black shape, shaped like Donkey Kong, you know, conical head, white chest, legs. Just do this. And I go, huh. I take my thermal camera and I hand it to Toad. And I'm like, hey, look over there and tell me what you see. Because, and keep in mind, we're there looking for Bigfoot. I see something in my camera that looks like Bigfoot. What do I do? I give the camera to somebody else. I know. Train investigator folks. Toad looks through the camera and goes, it looks like a dude. 
All of our parties accounted for. We know where everybody is. The people that aren't standing there with us right then and there are behind us. None of our people. Uh, Toad passes the camera to Reed. Reed looks at it. Reed says, yeah, that does look like a person. Somehow the camera makes it back to me. At this point, I'm like, maybe I should hit record, right? So I finally hit record, and this is what I get. I apologize, folks. I mean, curse a big foot. We're going to have some nice blob spots here. But uh, this is what I got. So you can see, it seems like it's got a wide upper body and uh, skinnier lower body. So what happened was, is we're looking at this, we kind of start moving towards it because we wanted to get uh, the footage. And you guys saw the terrain earlier. It's not exactly like, you know, we can just sprint over there. So I'm looking, stepping, looking, stepping, looking, stepping. And it's diminishing as I'm getting closer. Um, we walked over around the area, didn't see anything, but, you know, nothing on the ground. I heard you guys about the ground. There's just no tracks, not even anything pressed down. Uh, full disclosure, some of the decaying trees, stuff, stuff like that was putting off heat. Uh, but this, you know, it was pretty consistent heat, you know, as things decay. Uh, this thing, it changed shape, you know, I'm not saying it's a shape changer, but it went from looking like Donkey Kong to looking like that. Um, so I can only assume that it was moving. Uh, it did seem to get smaller. I don't know. But uh, that was probably the, the big thing that happened to us on that expedition. And that's kind of why I was like, I was, I was into Bigfoot. Like, I thought Bigfoot was a thing. But after that, I was like, I got to find out what the hell that is. Um, my wife says, you know, she uses words like obsessed. You know, I like to use the word enthusiast. I don't know what it was. I wish I could say tell you guys it was Bigfoot or decaying trees, but I don't know. I want to be the only Bigfoot speaker you guys are probably going to hear is going to say, I don't know anything about Bigfoot. That's me, Stephen, Adam Davis. That's when we went in 2019. We went with the uh, Travel Channel to film uh, The Last of Triangle. I think it was the first or second episode in that uh, first season. A bunch of good guys. Film crew from England. It's funny uh, watching them out in the woods, like stumbling around, and go back to the boat, and they want their tea and crumpets. And good guys. All right. So we're going to leave Port Chatham. We're going to start talking about Area A. Remember, I showed you guys where that was on the map. Uh, you guys notice Area A terrain looks a lot like Port Chatham terrain. In fact, I could show you a picture. I could tell you guys that was Port Chatham, and you'd be like, yeah, it Check it out. <laughs> but uh, very similar in terrain, very similar in the same flora fauna, and uh, I mean, technically not that far away from each other, I guess, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, so area A, that name kind of kind of like beans, everything. It's kind of stuck. Uh, the owner really didn't like it. He's like, oh, we got to come up with a better name, guys. He. Uh, when he first started getting into the Bigfoot stuff, he heard about the North American Wood Ape Conservancy. They have a research area that they uh, go to called Area X. And we just kind of started calling it Area A for Alaska. And Scott, the owner, was like, oh, we got to come up with a better name. And I kept coming up with stuff and sending it to him. And he went, like, I don't know, I don't know. He would make a decision. And here we are, like, three years later, and we're still calling it Area A. So. I think there are guys, I don't know what to tell you. Um, Scott buys some land, he wants to build a cabin. Uh, he's a lifelong outdoorsman. He's been hunting, fishing all his life. He's the real deal. Uh, he's a pilot for a major airline. You know, not a, not a Bigfoot guy. Doesn't care about Bigfoot. Bigfoot was never a thing, never on his radar. Spent a lot of time out in the woods, had no reason to believe that Bigfoot were real. Starts building a cabin and stuff starts happening. Uh, they're hammering, they're building a cabin, and he starts hearing screams and yells and roars for animals that he can't recognize. Like I said, this guy's, he's, he's hunting a lot in Alaska and other places. And he's like, what the hell is that? I can't figure it out. He starts doing some research, and 
you know, we hear some Sasquatch vocalization, alleged Sasquatch vocalizations, and says, man, that's pretty close to what I was hearing. So he kind of gets into the Bigfoot thing, starts researching, no, well, not researching, like going out and looking for Bigfoot, but looking into the Bigfoot phenomenon. And he finds some parallels uh, between his piece of property and Bigfoot activity. So the cooler story is my favorite story from area A. I wasn't involved in it, I'm telling you this third hand. So as they were building the cabin, that's another thing too, as they started building the cabin, but when the cabin was completed, it seemed like the activity maybe, it didn't stop, but it seemed like it wound down just a little bit. Uh, Rob Roy and I have been out there a few times, and there's been times when we've gone out there and nothing happened. Isn't that right, Rob Roy? That's right. Where'd they go? Rob Roy Music, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so we've been out there a few times, nothing happened. Uh, Rob's had some interesting stuff out there. I'm sure he's probably going to talk about it. I'm sure Alex is going to talk about it, too. So I don't know, I'm not going to carry you you guys to death. But uh, see that, that cooler right there, the big Yeti cooler, you could probably put a body in. And I don't want to say that because I'm calm, not because of other reasons. So that's one of those big, heavy Yeti coolers. Um, I mean, it's, it's big. It's expensive too. So they were building the cabin, they were framing it in. It didn't have this deck or front door. So they were going around to the back of the cabin and they had a hole in the, in the wall, had a little ramp going up to it. And then at night when they go to bed, they went into one of the bedrooms. They just put a piece of plywood up over that hole and they slide that cooler up against it. I mean, this is like top shelf security stuff right here. And there was a couple of guys out there helping them build the cabin. They're sleeping in that room. It's the They call it the bunk room. Uh, it's the room where me and Rob Roy used to sleep when we go out there. Not the same bed. And uh, it's a bunk room. And I said, it's, it's cool. Rob Roy would sleep with me if he had to. He, he, he's not opposed to cuddling up if Sasquatch is... He did creep you wouldn't go there. Yeah. Well, we'd spoon to find big fun, wouldn't we, Rob? So, They've got the cooler pushed up against the makeshift door. It's like two or three o'clock in the morning. It's, it's dark. Uh, it's dark enough outside that you can't see. And something, boom, something hits that makeshift door. And that cooler, which is full of food, by the way, it probably, I think Scott said it, he's like, it had to weigh at least 40 pounds, probably more. Cooler slides across the room and hits the other wall, on the opposite wall. The makeshift door falls in, and go for this stuff. He uh, hits the it hits the wall. The makeshift door falls down. Uh, the guys in the bunk room they can't see anything, but they're just assuming. You know, they start yelling, "Go away, bear! Go away, bear!" And they hear Scott comes running out of his bedroom with a shotgun, thinking these guys are yelling, "Bear!" I just heard a loud boom. They're probably bear. He comes running out of his bedroom with a shotgun. And as he turns the corner, he hears, because there's a big hill behind the cabin here, he hears thump, 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 thump something's running up the hill. Uh, again, nobody saw anything, but you know, it was pretty weird. That was, a, that was a really heavy cooler. Got slid all the way across the cabin floor. And that, combined with all the other stuff that was going on there, uh, they found some tracks for some reason, the Bigfoot, if they are Bigfoot, uh, really seemed interested in his outhouse. Uh, he had like a box, you know, high tech stuff. When he first started out, he had a box with a hole cut in it, and he put a toilet seat on it. He just put a toilet seat in the box. Uh, whatever it was, really didn't like that. Did not like him pooping in the woods. Uh, I think at least on two occasions, he found his toilet seat ripped off the box, the wooden box, and it's thrown into the woods. No paw marks, no teeth marks, stuff like that on the toilet seat. Just the wood screws that he used to secure it onto the box. So I ripped it off, throw it in the woods. I have it at least twice. Um, I think one of the first tracks they found, uh, they actually found by the outhouse. They were putting in the more permanent outhouse. And they had dug a hole. And in the dirt next to the outhouse was the track. I believe Robert actually has a cast of that in his store. You didn't bring that with you, did you, Ryan? Right? Oh, you hear that? Go over to Rob's and have him tell you the story and look at the, the track they found next to the 
next to the uh, outhouse. Poop squash. Uh, they had rock throwing, vocals, activities, things moved, missing. Uh, another story that I like at Scott Hills, he had a splitting mall, and he used out there to split wood to put the stove. And, you know, this place is really remote. It doesn't really have any neighbors. It's not like people are going to like walk by and, oh, here's a splitting mall, I want to take it. You know, you got to get there by boat. And so sometimes he'll just take his tools or something and, you know, store them under the, under the deck there or leave them on the porch or whatever. And uh, he, comes, he comes out one time and he's like, man, where's my splitting mall? Can't find it. Looks everywhere for it. Can't find it. Looks in the shed. Looks anywhere where he would have normally left it. Can't find it. Finally, he's like, oh, I guess maybe, I guess maybe I lost it or maybe I inadvertently took it back home or something. So he ends up buying a new splitting mall, brand new one. On the, the next trip, he comes out and brings his new splitting mall out. And he goes to split some wood, and there, where his old splitting mall went missing from, it's back. So something brought the splitting mall back, put it back where it found That's weird. So I think it was last year, we uh, showed up, first trip of the year, you can tell there's still snow on the ground. And uh, this is the trail. I'm standing here, there's a trail that goes down to the beach where we land and uh, come up to the cabin. And this tree was bent, blocking the trail. Uh, it was a heavy snow load here, so maybe the snow bent the tree over. But uh, you can see there's trees a smaller diameter all around it, and they're not moved. This one's actually a little bent because it's, it's bent over onto it, touching it. Uh, if this had happened anywhere else, it probably wouldn't have been that big of a deal, but because it was blocking the trail that we used to get to the cabin, I thought it was worth documenting. Uh, I've heard of stuff like that before, where people will go down the trail, come back, and there'll be a log or something across the trail. Uh, it's kind of odd, possibly territorial behavior, but uh, you know that's not something you're going to bend easily and get to stay that way. Maybe it was snow load, I don't know, but uh, I thought it was worth documenting. Uh, here's a track Rob and I found. You know, if you read my book Swatch Cop, I talk about like having equipment and uh, scale in every photo. Thought we were just going to go for a quick little walk um, up the up the stream a little bit, and I didn't take my backpack with me. All I had was a twenty dollar bill in my wallet, so I was like, I gotta get some scale with this. Uh, you can see, looks like there's a big toe, some smaller toes, a heel impression there. Uh, this was kind of going uphill, up toward a little uh, raised up, uh, ridge, and that was the only one that it found. Uh, there was some other areas where it was kind of pressed down, uh, but uh, that was the only one that we found that looked like it left an impression. Uh, that would have been where, if you're going up the hill, you know, you would put weight down as you were pushing yourself up. There is without the scale, a little bit clearer photo. I don't know. It doesn't look like a bear track to me, but uh, again, I didn't see what made it, so I can't sit here and tell you that's a big foot track. It is interesting, though, uh, especially if you talk to Dr. Milgram. He'll talk sometimes about how the front of the foot, the toes, will be deeper than the heel compressions, and it certainly seems that way there. You see where the toes actually went into the ground, and the heels did not. But then again, it wasn't going to be. Uh, that's a pretty common trait on second satisfied tracks. Uh, look guys, you guys are paying to look at poop. <laughs> Nobody laughed. So. Thank you. <laughs> so again, this last time, Rob and I were out just last month, uh, we're walking around, kind of exploring a little bit, and we're following this game trail. There's a bunch of deer poop on the game trail. And by the way, that's another thing. There's not supposed to be deer out there where the scouting is. There are. Scott Seal, he's got them on video on the game cameras. Uh, but the court of fishing game, no deal. <clears throat> so we're following the skate trail. There's deer poop all along the skate trail. And then all of a sudden, it's pretty cool because you can actually see, I recorded it, I was recording with my GoPro as we're walking around. And I walk by it and I stop 
And I go, hey, Rob, come here, look. And it's pretty cool because I was actually filming for this part, and you can get Rob's reaction to it. Because he walks over and he goes, oh, that was human. <laughs> so pretty cool reaction. Um, so there were some more pieces, but I, this one was like one of the best like put together. So I chose it as a representation. It's about three inches long, an inch wide. Uh, it did have seeds in it, probably not human. Uh, I showed it to some biologists in Amy Boo's uh, Project Zoo book. Uh, they all pretty much said, that's ah, probably bear. So I don't know. I wanted to get it tested for uh, parasites. I had a veterinarian tell me one time, because I've found some strange species before. You know, I kind of knew from my law enforcement training, like, you can't really get DNA from the feces. So I was kind of like, ah, I'm not going to mess with it. I'm not going to pick it up. And I said, I was talking about some feces I saw, and the veterinarian tells me, like, well, you should, took it to get a test. And I'm like, well, you can't really get DNA from feces. You know, it's kind of a crapshoot. And he goes, no. He goes, you don't test for DNA. He goes, you test for parasites. He said, if you get a veterinarian or somebody that tested for parasites, you know, you find some feces up in the woods in Alaska and it comes back positive for parasites that only occur in primates, you might have some. So I actually picked that goof up with my bare hands and um, brought it home. And it kind of happened at a bad time. Like my wife and I were getting ready to go on a long weekend. I didn't want to freeze it. And I reached out to a couple people like, hey, can you test this? And they didn't get back to me in a timely manner. And I was like, I gotta, I gotta, I'm gotta, i going to have to get rid of this. I can't just hate it. Have this poop sitting in the cooler on my front porch for forever. Uh, so I didn't hear anything back from the testing people to get it tested. And the Amy Boo Zoo book people said it was probably bare, so I ended up not getting it tested. Uh, this is the handprint. I'm sure Alex is going to talk about this. He's actually the one that found it. He was out there filming uh, last year, it was coming down the hill behind the cabin, and I saw the handprint. This, it's a I lightened the photo a little bit, I'm sorry, darkened the photo a little bit so that the print would be more uh, evident. But uh, that's a pretty accurate representation for it. You see it with your naked eye. It's on the back of the cabin, right underneath that buff room window. Remember the story I was telling you with the cooler, where the cooler got pushed across the, the floor? That's about where that, uh, that makeshift door would have been, where the handprint is. Uh, you can see clearly. Four fingers and a palm. There was no thumb. Uh, it wasn't beyond human standards. I mean, I got little, I got little dainty fingers, uh, but it was bigger than my hand. But there's a, probably people in here right now that have bigger hands than I do. Uh, the interesting thing about it is it does have dermal ridges. Uh, you can actually see them right there, right there, and a little bit on the palm. Um, my opinion, I mean, it's, this is either a human print or a Sasquatch print. There's no, no other explanation. Um, it's not bear. You know, bears don't have dermal ridges. Um, Dr. Meldrum, I think, seems to think it's human. It may be. It's just kind of in a more weird spot. And it would have had to have been there for about a year. Because the last time anybody was back there or like, doing any work was when uh, Scott was installing his gutters on the back of the cabin, and it's just an odd spot. It's not super high up. I think it's about six foot off the ground. And again, it's not in a huge, uh, it's not outside the range of the human, uh, but it's in a kind of weird spot because it's right beneath the window. And it's, you know, up here, probably about my head level, probably six foot off the ground or so. And there's something to look in there. There's like a water tank right here. Uh, Watch the video where I swab it for DNA. You know, I kind of got like, you know, I'm like standing over here, like swabbing like this. Uh, for somebody to stand there and put that hammer up there, they would basically have to be leaning over that water tank. It's just an odd situation. It's an odd um, place for it to be naturally, and uh, it's kind of it's hard to explain. Doug Highcheck, he talks a little bit about something called albovarnix which is the white substance that Sasquatch leaves behind when they potentially touch things. Uh, he seems to think that it has to do with the oils they secrete. I don't know. Um, I swabbed it, treated it just like a crime scene, came in, used the capture swabs, which are swabs that have little plastic things on the end of them where you can close them up. 
I did two swab swabs of the palm, two swabs of each finger, and I sent them to Doug Highcheck. You don't know Doug Highcheck is the uh, producer of Monster Quest. He's producing Sasquatch Legend of Science 2, which I believe we are uh, filming right now, or ramping up the film. And he has the swabs in his possession right now, and he says he's going to get them tested. And uh, I really can't wait to find out when he do this. I told my wife, I said, if it comes back, Anything, you know, as long as it's not human, we're probably gonna get some champagne or something to celebrate. Uh, I tell you what, people, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical, uh, but uh, I think that would probably be enough for me right there, because I think if it come back as something, a non-human primate or something like that, for me, I mean, with my involvement in swabbing it and knowing that the chain of custody and all that was followed, uh, that would probably be enough for me to push me to 100%, because right now I'm in the 90s. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna wrap it up because we're running up against the, the next speaker. Uh, I wanna thank the Royal Bigfoot Committee again, Jesse, Heidi, Norm, Michael. I wanna thank Stephen Major for Extreme Expeditions to get me out of Fort Chatham. Uh, just a fun tidbit. Uh, we were gonna go back, I think in 20, 2021. Uh, you know, we had a lot of criticism about the first movie, like why didn't you guys stay there? Why didn't you do this, why didn't you do that? We're like, yeah, let's do it. Let's go back with more people. Let's camp on the ground. Let's, you know, uh, let's do it again. And uh, Steve reached out to English Bay Corporation, and they denied us permission to go out there because they'd given somebody else permission to go out there. Uh, I'd like to thank the English Bay Corporation for letting us out there in the first place. Uh, Scott, the owner of Area A, and anybody that listens to my podcast, uh, I really appreciate you. I try to keep it free. I don't charge a Patreon or anything. Uh, but also don't put down the regular schedule, so you might not get an episode this month because I'm doing this, and then after this, I'm going to be putting it out. So you're going to have to stay tuned. That's where you can find me. You can take a picture of that. Find my podcast pretty much any kind of podcatcher, Spotify, iTunes, anything like that. You can watch my videos. Um, if you watch any of them, you should watch the one called Strange Things and Foot in Area 8 because that's where Rob Roy and I find the poop, and his reaction to that is pretty positive. <gasps> it looks human. <laughs> and it's spontaneous, it's in the moment. It's really cool. I was about to film it. So many times, like I was telling you guys about the curse of Bigfoot, you're like not filming when you should be. And uh, it's kind of cool to get that natural reaction from him. And uh, I told you guys I'd tell you about my nickname. So uh, Beans Baxter comes from the Fox Network. Back when Fox first came out, they had Married with Children, 21 Jump Street. And all these shows, well, in there, somewhere in that lineup, they had this little show called The New Adventures of Beans Baxter. It's about this kid, and his dad was a spy. He was like in high school or something. Dad gets kidnapped by the bad and spies, and the people his dad worked for, they come in to recruit Beans so he can go and help find his dad. Well, the show called Beans Baxter. My last name is Baxter, and it just people started calling me that in elementary school, and it just kind of stuck. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't help that my dad's name was Larry, too. So it helped them to differentiate us. Uh, in fact, one of my best friends in the whole world, uh, Tim from back home in Kentucky, uh, first time I met him, I'm like, hi, I'm Beans. And he's like, no, what's your real name? And I'm like, call me Beans. And he's like, I'm not calling a grown man Beans. What's your name? So I'm like, call me Larry. So he calls my house one day and he goes, hey, is Larry there? And my mom's like, what's, which, you mean Beans? And he's like, okay, it's Beans, I'll call you Beans. If your mom calls you Beans, I'll call you Beans. So, so I've been Beans ever since. Doesn't have anything to do with the music of fruit. I'm sorry, guys. You know, I know y'all were hoping. But uh, anyway, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you guys so much for coming and listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, come see me over my table and I'll chat with you if you've got questions or anything like that. And uh, who's introducing the next speaker? Are we taking a break? We have a 10 minute break. I yeah. Think. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break. Uh, get water, get potty. Thank you guys so much.